Hey there, I'm Daryl Crouch. Welcome to the Midweek Connection. Uh, we call it the Midweek Connection because it's the middle of the week and we want to connect with you. Pretty creative title we came up with a few weeks ago, but I hope you're doing well. Uh, one of the things I've noticed uh, during uh, this time of quarantine and safe at home orders and uh, social distancing and all of that, I've noticed that uh, as our family spent a lot of time together, uh, we, we all like music, I've noticed. Uh, we'll find uh, programming on television that, um, you know, is, is music, uh, is, is a celebration of music in some way, whether it's the Grand Ole Opry on Saturday nights or American Idol on Sunday nights or another uh, awards kind of show uh, that's come across or uh, we find on social media uh, people playing a guitar or um, a, a choir uh, doing a Zoom uh, performance of a wonderful song, uh, we, we're, we gravitate toward music. And I've noticed that as different as all six of us in our family are, our personalities are different, our interests are different, uh, the things that we would do with our spare time is different, we all have a playlist on our, on our phones. Uh, we, we all like music. We all uh, find music to be helpful and encouraging to us. Uh, and I re realize that whether it's in our family or uh, other people, that we're all bent a little different. Like, uh, not all of us are creatives or artsy, if that's the right word, um, but we all seem to like music and we all seem to understand the power of it. I was thinking uh, about that as we are looking at this New Testament letter that Paul wrote to the Colossians. And we'll look at what, was, what we believe was a a, a, a hymn of the early church. We'll look at that in a moment. But before I get there, I was thinking back to uh, Exodus 15 when God delivered his people out of Egyptian bondage. And you remember that he miraculously saved them as they crossed the Red Sea on dry land. And then he flooded the enemy, uh, the waters on top of the enemy, so that the enemy was defeated there in the Red Sea. Um, I, let me, if I can find Exodus 15, I'll read part of that, part of that song to you. You would, you would think that after a great victory like that, there would be a song. And so somebody, there was a songwriter around, and here's the words they wrote. I will sing to the Lord, for He is highly exalted. He has thrown the horse and its rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is His name. Isn't that good? I mean, when, when we win the victory or when the Lord wins the victory for us, man, we, there's a song in our heart. And uh, music and singing have always been a big part of our faith in God and our walk with Jesus. Um, but you know, there's sometimes that it's harder to sing a song. It's harder to find a song. Sometimes the difficulties of life kind of uh, cause us to lose heart. And as a result, we lose our song. We see that in Psalms 137. Uh, matter of fact, the whole book of Psalms is a book of songs. So it tells you how important music and singing to the Lord is. But in this case, they had a th this, this particular Psalm is a reminder that sometimes it's tough to sing to the Lord. They're, the people of Israel are in Babylonian captivity and Psalm 137 one begins, by the rivers of Babylon, uh, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion, that is our homeland, Jerusalem. Uh, there we hung our lyres on the poplar trees for our captors there ask us for songs and our tormentors for rejoicing. Sing us one of the songs of Zion, they would say. And the Israelites responded, How can we sing the Lord's song on a foreign soil? You may be feeling that way today. You may be a little discouraged. I don't know. Uh, it seems like uh, these days of uncertainty and of difficulty, um, sometimes we we find that these, these moments uh, cause us to lose our song and we have a hard time remembering the faithfulness of God. Sometimes we have a hard time mustering up the strength in us or the energy in us to, to sing to the Lord. 
Uh, sometimes uh, even when we're meeting together, when uh, we're gathering for corporate worship, every now and then I'll look around the room of worshipers and I'll find many of the folks in the room as, as, as we should be singing, they're, they're not singing. Uh, they're standing stoic. And I don't know if it's that they don't know the song or that they don't like to hear themselves sing, but by the facial expressions, it looks like discouragement may be, may be winning the day. When Paul wrote to the Colossian church, uh, they were going through a difficult season. There were people coming into their church saying things that weren't exactly true about God, weren't exactly true about what who Jesus is and what Jesus had done for them on the cross and what the significance of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection really uh, was for them. And so they were, there was some discouragement that was beginning to, to make its way in. Uh, not only discouragement, but uh, deception and distraction and uh, that was threatening, another D word, to detour their faith. And you would think that Paul would, would just go straight into uh, all the reasons they should um, rejoice and all the reasons they should return to Jesus and all the reasons they shouldn't be discouraged and all of that. And, and Paul was an incredibly um, intelligent and he uh, a teacher of the Bible. He had a theological mind about him, no question about that. But what I find interesting as he's opening this letter, he does encourage them in some ways. He reminds them, as we've talked about in the last few weeks, of who they are in Christ and what is already settled for them on their behalf. But then he quotes this hymn, this hymn that they probably were familiar with. We don't have, obviously, the musical score to it, so I'm not going to try to sing it for you today. I know you're grateful for that. But I just want you to notice what this hymn communicates and what it seems that Paul, as theologically minded as he was, was not without an understanding of how important music and worship and how important it was to praise Jesus for who he is, uh, even in the middle of discouraging times, maybe especially in the middle of times and seasons of discouragement. So I want you to notice what Paul is doing as he is walking them through this hymn. Notice what he is teaching them and reminding them, really, about who Jesus is. Beginning in verse uh, 10 of chapter 1 of Colossians, it says, He is the image, speaking about Jesus, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. Now I'm going to stop there for just a moment, and then we'll, we'll finish that hymn. But uh, I just want to make a few comments along the way. Paul said and reminded the Colossian believers, and the Holy Spirit included it here to remind us today, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. What does that mean? That Jesus was the uh, human um, picture of who God is. Uh, when the disciples looked at Jesus, they were looking into the face of God. Jesus is the image, the icon, that which we can see of who God is, which means that uh, Jesus is the eternal God of heaven. That is, along with the members of the Godhead, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, Jesus is God. And so um, as we think about uh, the discouraging things around us, as we're starting to question whether or not we're going to make it through, Paul was saying, listen, I want to remind you that Jesus, the one who died in your place, is the one who is the eternal God of the universe. And everything was created by Him. He created everything that is in heaven and on earth, the things that we can see, the things that we cannot see. Whether thrones or dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created by Him. 
Do you see the expansiveness of Jesus' kingdom, of His domain? As a, matter, as, as a matter of fact, there is nothing that exists that is outside of His authority. There is nothing that is happening in your life or in my life. There is no plot of ground that we will uh, walk on. There is no bed that we will sleep in. There is no air that we will breathe. There is no molecule floating around in our bodies, if that's what molecules do. there There is nothing that is that is not under the domain of Jesus Himself. There is no limit to His power. There is no limit to the scope of His authority over all that exists. What does that mean for me and for you? It means that we can trust God with everything that is happening in our lives. That that we can trust God with everyone who is making decisions that affect us. I was um, thinking earlier today that it's, it's very often that people that we don't even know make decisions that affect us. We were having a staff meeting this morning and talking about um, some, uh, some uh, instructions that the government are giving us in terms of rolling uh, back into uh, uh, to operation as an economy and as churches and so on. And, and I, I don't know any of those people. I, I've met the governor uh, a couple of times. Um, I've, I'm not spending time with him. He doesn't know me. Um, I've never met the president. I've never met the vice president of the United States. I, I, I don't know most of the people that are making decisions that affect me and my family and uh, my church family and my community. I, I, I don't know them personally. I, I don't have any personal influence really over most of the people making decisions that will affect some really important areas of my life and of my church's life. But I know the one who rules over them. I know the one who directs their steps. I know the one who puts them into place. I know him. His name is Jesus and I can trust him and I I can trust him with what he's doing in the world. He is before all things, verse um, 17 says. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. Jesus is our sustainer God. He is not only our creator God, and He's not only the eternal God. He is the sustainer God. He is the God who holds everything together. And the the word there is that uh, He holds everything together as if uh, they're glued together. It's that word of adhesiveness. Um, He's the one that's holding all this thing, all this together. You think your world is falling apart. It's not. I understand that it may be discouraging and there may be some uncertainty and you may have lost something great. You may have lost a loved one. You may have lost a job. You may have lost your nest egg. You may have lost uh, the prospect of the job that you were hoping for because of all this. But I want you to know that your life in Christ never falls apart. He is our sustainer God. Jesus is holding you in the palm of His hand. And your life may be difficult and it may feel like it's never going to get better. But there's a God in heaven who is holding you and is sustaining you. And then it says in verse 18, He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. Uh, Church life is very important to us. And uh, the church, there's a couple of ways to think about the church. Uh, Jesus is head of the body, the church. The church is the universal church of all believers of all times that have placed their faith in Jesus. We're part of a universal church. The word Catholic means universal. So the Roman Catholic Church got their name from this idea of the worldwide church. Um, So there is a a universal church that all believers are a part of. But there's also a local church, uh, expressions of, of the universal church in the local 
church family. Either way, Jesus is head of the church. The Pope is not a head of the Roman Catholic Church, or he's a head of the Roman Catholic Church in ecclesiology, I guess, but uh, the Pope's not the head of the church. Your pastor's not the head of the church. Uh, your favorite uh, TV preacher is not head of the church. The government is not head of the church. Jesus is head of the church. And I want you to know that your church is in good hands. Church and the local expression of the body of Christ in these lo in local churches like Green Hill Church and whatever your church home may be, uh, things are different around here. There's no doubt about that. And we will gather again, and things won't all be altogether different in the future. I know some things will change, and we are learning some things. I'm recording this on my iPhone today in, in an empty building, and so um, we're learning a lot of new things that will uh, help us, I think, in the days ahead. And we'll learn to care for each other, I think, a little bit better, and we'll learn uh, some of the things that are uh, really more important than other things. Sometimes we get a little bit off track, and so uh, I think these days have helped to recalibrate us and remind us of what's most important. Uh, so there'll be some things that change as we go forward. But not everything's going to change. We're going to worship again together. We're, we're going to uh, fellowship together. We're going to gather around God's Word together and build up each other and strengthen each other in the faith. And we're going to scatter every week and go into the highways and byways of life and make disciples wherever we live, work, and play. We're still going to make disciples of Jesus who live for His kingdom. That's not changed. But uh, the operations of the church and the people involved in a particular church and uh, the, th the kinds of things that we do and the things that we're able to do financially and uh, all those things may change and there may be some shifting that goes on, but I want you to know that your church is in good hands. Jesus is our shepherd king. And he is a, he is a king, he is a, a, a God who will take care of his church. The gates of hell, 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 the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And uh, he is building his church. And I want you to know that the future is bright. Not because I'm bright, not because you're bright, although you are, uh, not because you've got a great uh, facility here, not because we've, we've got some great things going on. No, no, no. The, the future is bright. And we have every reason to be optimistic about the future because Jesus is is our shepherd king. He is our shepherd God. He is the God who holds this church in his hands and he is making a way. All right, I need to move along. And then finally he says in verse 19 and 20, for God was pleased to have him, and have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It's a profound statement that this hymn, this, this hymn was rich with uh, the theology. This uh, hymn was a reminder that we are justified by grace through faith, that we are justified by the blood of Jesus on the cross, that we are reconciled to God. You see, Jesus isn't simply our shepherd king because he won the, the, the campaign, that he got the most votes. No, he is our shepherd king. He is our sustainer God because he has uh, won the victory over sin, death, and the grave. And he has reconciled us to his Father forever. And there is nothing anyone can do to make him snatch you out of his hands. Our future is secure in Jesus. We have been given peace with God through the blood of Jesus, and nothing can change that. Your circumstances may not be so peaceful. The things that you're thinking about tomorrow that you need to do may attempt to steal your joy. But I want you to know that joy is a decision that's rooted in our peace with God. That our ability to sing and praise Jesus isn't a factor of our circumstances, 
or of our relationships or of the problems that are around us. Listen, we can sing to Jesus because he has given us peace with God. And because he's given us peace with God, we have the peace of God that washes over us and is planted deep within us and bears great fruit. I want you to know that you, if you're in Christ, you still have a song to sing. And the, the object of that song or the subject matter of that song, His name is Jesus and He is worth it. And we're not singing to an idea, we're not singing to a, to a concept that may come through we're not singing to some faulty sense of, of love that we might be able to produce. We are singing to the God in heaven who has uh, created us for a relationship with His Father, who has sustained us by His hand, who has shepherded us um, in His... Uh, eternal love and grace and mercy and has rescued us from the penalty of sin and death and the grave. So there's a lot of difficulty around us, but none of it, none of it is, uh, none of the bad news is as good as the good news is good. And so you, you and I in Christ, we still have a song to sing. Let me pray for you, pray with you, and then I've got a couple things to say and I'll be done. Father, thank you that, there, that you are our eternal God who has sent your Son to uh, die in our place, uh, conquer sin, death, and the grave uh, as a risen King on the third day. He now sits at the right hand of the Father. Lord, I pray that for those of us who have maybe lost our song, we would turn our eyes to Jesus. We would look full in His wonderful face so that all the things around us, all the things of this earth, all the difficulties would grow dim in the light of His grace. Lord, I thank You that Jesus is enough. We turn our hearts to Him today. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining me in this kind of session today. These are important times for us to keep our eyes on Jesus. And I hope that, that this will be an encouragement to you uh, as you consider uh, what the next few days looks like, I just encourage you to pray uh, for your uh, neighbors. Uh, pray for those that are uh, single or widowed or they don't have a lot of family around them taking care of them. Would you pay attention and walk in step with the Spirit and, and allow God to give you a sensitivity and opportunity to serve them? I mentioned earlier that sometimes church work we've complicated a little bit sometimes, uh, but uh, being a disciple of Jesus isn't very complicated. It really is about loving God and loving our neighbors. So these days of uh, isolation, they don't have to isolate us from our mission of uh, loving other people in Jesus' name and sharing the good news of the gospel. Another thing I would encourage you, uh, some, and you'll see this coming across social media, but uh, we'd love to hear your story uh, of uh, how Jesus changed you. And so there's a hashtag going around called Jesus Changed My Life. And uh, we'd encourage you just to shoot a, a minute and a half or two minute video of your testimony of how Jesus changed your story, how he changed your life. Uh, how you were lost, uh, how you became a believer, and uh, how you were saved, and, and what difference Jesus has made in your life since then. And uh, just post that on your social media channel. Uh, you can uh, tag Green Hill Church in that. We'd love to share that and uh, be an encouragement to the hundreds and thousands of people who are following all of us on social media. The last thing I'd encourage you is stay connected to at greenhillchurch.com. If you're not connected to a life group, we'd love for you to do that. If you're not joining us for worship, join us on Sundays at 10.30 uh, a.m. You can go to our website, greenhillchurch.com. You can go to Facebook Live or YouTube Live. Uh, any of those ways, you can find us at 10.30 every Sunday morning. Hey, God bless you. Have a great week. I really do look forward to seeing you soon.